Cool. Hi, everyone. Obviously, uh, I'm Chris. I'm not Anwen. Um, Anwen isn't here, but uh, this is the, what I'm talking about today is basically kind of a plug uh, for a paper that me and Anwen wrote a couple of years ago. It's the references at the bottom, but it'll come up at the end again if you buy what I'm selling. <laughs> I want to read it in any more detail. Um, so a lot of the ideas in this came from Anwen as well as myself, but this is obviously my version. So if you disagree with anything I say, blame me, don't blame Anwin. Um, so me and Anwin both worked on a project called Inglade, which stood for English Landscapes and Identities, or it had a longer title as well, uh, which was ERC funded and ran from 2011 to 2016. We're still finishing off some of the publications, but none of us are currently employed on the project anymore, although I think all of us currently have jobs, which is always good. <laughs> Uh, so Inglade was a, a rather huge, some might say insane, uh, legacy data sort of collation project. We amassed over 900,000 records and many gigabytes of spatial data for English archaeology from the Bronze Age to about 1000 AD. The Doomsday Book was our endpoint. Um, and I think it's fair to say that no project on this scale has ever before been uh, attempted in English archaeology and particularly not since the massive data explosion after developer funding came in in the early 90s. Uh, so what we called at the time PPG 16 in England and sort of is very similar to the Valletta Treaty. Uh, so Inglade as a project resulted in this kind of huge opportunity to understand the nature and complexity of legacy data in English archaeology um, but it's also relevant beyond England as I think we all face fairly similar challenges. So today I'm going to talk about what we call uh, characterful data. So much has been written about the technical issues involved in coping with uh, massive data sets and data sets generally, such as fragility, quality, interoperability, integration, integrity, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's also important to acknowledge that data sets are socially and historically produced. We have to understand the histories and relationships that our data embody if we're going to understand our data themselves. So, and the idea that we sort of came up with was that in doing so, it becomes possible to balance archaeology's widely endorsed quest for data that are complete, certain, coherent, all those sort of things, with the practicalities of working with data that make these idealisms seem impossible to achieve. Uh, the data sets that we worked on with Inglade were diverse both in sort of content, structure, technology, and in their social and economic context of development. Some are under threat in the current economic climate and their continued existence relies upon demonstration of their usefulness and that they're actually being used. Um, so there's reluctance in some quarters we've found in archeology span in England to use these secondary data sets due to concerns about their accuracy and reliability but it's actually really important that we do use them otherwise they're going to die. Um, the relationships between archaeological entities and the digital records they become uh, exhibit sort of elastic properties so what I mean by that is they change over time as new users and administrators apply the same which are often technically fixed terminologies and classifications but in different ways. And the decisions that archaeological curators make are not black and white, but reliant on metaphorical understandings of given entities within particular contexts. So as such, ostensibly similar entities can end up represented in diverse ways in different data sets due to their differing histories. And we often seem to think that this is a unique problem for archaeology or archaeological data, but it really isn't. Does this thing work? I don't know. Who's that? So, uh, the paper referenced at the bottom by these guys, Bowker and Starr, uh, looked at very similar issues in the context of the World Health Organization's International Classification of Diseases. This is just a random page from the ICD. I chose tuberculosis because it was the first disease that came into my mind. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so as archaeologists, we might assume that the medical sciences are better at agreeing on fixed terminologies and definitions than we are, but they ain't because they're human, <laughs> just like us. Um, so Bowker and Starr found that the ICD has, I'm going to list these things now, a tendency to obscure the relationship practices and histories from which it was formed. Its users employ the fixed terminologies and standards in different ways. 
different practitioners tend towards lumping or splitting data into more or less categories. Many entities invade neat, evade neat categorization. You also see that technology is employed in variable ways. Uh, they also saw that information systems struggle to match the mobility of research environments. And finally, that there's a politics involved in defining and employing categories in and of itself. So in practice in the ICD, the data categories become compromised through attempts to make them accurate for multiple groups and attempts to standardise practices amongst the users typically provoke a sort of fluorescence of local modifications and variations rather than producing greater conformity. Sorry, I was doing a Gillings impression then, wasn't I? <laughs> All of these issues should sound familiar to people working with archaeological data sets because we argue that we, <laughs> we say we have the same problems, basically, because we do. Um, but Barker and Starr argue that they shouldn't necessarily be viewed in a negative light as modification and variations are important, making data relevant at a local level for their primary users. They argue that resistance to standardization is necessary as that is how information systems are able to evolve. Data managers should, in their opinion, abandon their faith in sort of creating unified systems to describe the world and instead focus their attention on developing strategies to better handle the diversity and practicalities of the world. Um, and Bowker and Starr argued for a new kind of data management research, exploring the nuanced topographies and histories of information infrastructures, what they described as a plate tectonics rather than a static geology. I'm just going to get some water. Oops. Oh well. Yeah, I'll get it in the end. <laughs> so the issue that I'm going to cover today, which is one of many, uh, but the issue that I'm going to talk about today, one of the major issues with the data we gathered for Inglade involved the different sort of spatial scales at which archaeological data are managed across England. So what most people in English archaeology would consider the main or the most complete record are the around 80 local historic environment records which are maintained by local authorities. But there are also a number of national level data sets administered by bodies such as Historic England, represented here by Keith, <laughs> or, the <laughs> or the British Museum, which also record archaeological data. Um, so when we tested this manually through map overlay analysis of sample areas, these showed varying levels of overlap with the local uh, HER records. So the top one is the national record of the historic environment. Um, and these were the 30 odd HERs we tested. Um, and this is the percentage of overlap of those records in these little test squares we did. So some only had really low levels of uh, concurrence or overlap, whatever you want to call it, coherence with the NRHE, and some were very like inclusive. And these are just a couple of other data sets, the Archaeological Investigation Project and the GAS. And you can see there's kind of a tendency for NRHE things to be integrated in HER data sets and a tendency for the Portugal Antiquity Schemes to not be. Um, so all of this is caused by the specific historical circumstances through which the various data sets have come into their current form, which is a topic that's way too large for this presentation. Um, and this issue, in practice, for us, required a multi-scalar approach to its solution. So for the smaller case study areas, we manually checked for overlaps through map overlay and defined them as relationships in our database. And for larger case study areas and at a national level, we had to rely on some kind of automated process. And the way I did that was through simplifying all the terms even further to for the different types of sites and then filtering the data on a presence-absence basis using various uh, resolutions of spatial bin. So, the kind of problem, or however you want to look at it, with this uh, method is that it relies upon treating the inputted data as if they are accurate, i.e. giving the data the benefit of the doubt and assuming that it's unlikely to be wrong in any important way at the scales of analysis that we operated at. Uh, so, yeah, it's playing. This is just a video of our web app, which you can have a play around with if you go to the address at the top. So in practice, 
when we compared our data against data collated through more intensive manual processing methods by other projects, the only real differences we saw in our data from those were in the detail. The broad scale patterns were very consistent. In the few cases where we could see larger problems, these were readily apparent as they showed clear step changes at the edge of local authority areas. Um, creating these multiple data sets designed to operate at different scales, as you can see as we zoom in and out on this, um, enables us to approach a wide range of questions relating to past processes that themselves operated at a wide range of scales. Um, and when we opened up this data for exploration by members of the public or other people like you all or everyone else <laughs> uh, in a familiar sort of online setting, uh, we facilitated much easier access to data which is publicly available but relatively complex to get hold of and also to examine for a non-specialist, which I classify as democratisation. And also by offering the ability to download these synthetic data sets to anyone who wishes although that would need a bit of GIS skill, we're enabling other researchers to examine a background picture of English archaeology, which they should find useful to contextualise their own findings or to challenge ours, which I label under disruption. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't, in the end, able to share our raw data because uh, we ran out of time to go <laughs> ask all the 80 people again uh, if they'd let us put it online, and I think most of them wouldn't have. Um, but it, 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 this kind of binned data is reasonably precise. It goes down to the nearest kilometre and at least lets people have some idea of what's out there, either in their local area or if they're researchers on a wider scale nationally. So, we would argue that digital archaeological data sets are characterful with diverse histories, contents and structures, and also with gaps, inconsistencies and uncertainties. Moves towards interoperability have helped to alleviate some of these issues, but the very characterfulness of data in and of itself can be valuable in terms of gaining insight into shifts in archaeological practice and that kind of thing. Uh, the many individuals and organisations that have had a hand in creating archaeological data sets over time mean that it's hardly surprising that they're complex and that sometimes their relationships to archaeological entities of themselves in and of themselves can appear ambiguous. But to reiterate it from what I said earlier, archaeology is not alone in this. So the three oh whoops, I don't know off too soon. Major conclusions that we came to in the paper that I referenced at the start are that one uh, despite their idiosyncrasies, archaeological data sets can perform amazing work, so we should not give up on them just because of concerns over objectivity, etc. Metadata and ontologies do help here, obviously. Secondly, it's vital to continue the quest to understand data better in their own right. This not only enables us to understand how to use data better and how to interpret the patterns that we find, but can also pro provide insight into ourselves as a research community. And given the previous discussion, it's essential that we develop more methods for working at a range of analytical scales. It can be fruitful interpretatively to pick the best data for our analyses, but it can also be very productive to try and look beyond the usual suspects and embrace available data on a wider and more <coughs> inclusive scale. And this is especially the case if we wish to justify our existence as a discipline, particularly commercially, in, at least for us in Brexit Britain, uh, increasingly <laughs> economically difficult and uncertain times. Thank you, David Cameron. Thank you. Thank you.